Hi, everyone. My name is April Brown, and I am the Digital Outreach Coordinator for the Archaeological Conservancy. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to our lecture this evening. Before we get started, um, I'd love to give a, a special shout out to our members in the audience this evening um, and just say thank you. The important work we do would not be possible without your support. And if you're not a member and you'd like to learn more, please visit our website at archaeologicalconservancy.org and click membership at the top of the page. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, our Midwestern Regional Director, Philip Milhouse, to introduce our guest speaker this evening. Phil? And for introductions. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Right. I just want to say good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you much for attending. And I consider it a great honor uh, to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Timothy Pocketat. He's the director of the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. He's the Illinois State Archaeologist and professor of anthropology and medieval studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Pocketat has also led well-renowned tours for Crow Canyon in the Southwest and will be leading a similar tour of the Cahokia area with Far Horizons in 2022. Through several decades, Dr. Pocketat has led students in conducting archeological research around the great Native American city of Cahokia. In scores of articles, too many to name and engaging books such as Medieval Mississippians and an Archeology span of the Cosmos, Dr. Pocketat has outlined a bold interpretation of Cahokia that incorporates archeological data, ethnography, religious studies, astronomy, and other fields to understand the Native American people who created and lived the history of this massive and well-ordered cultural complex. Not content with the grandeur of Cahokia, Dr. Pocketat also examines the long-term impact the rise of this city has for cultural developments across the mid-continent. With this, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Pocketat for an engaging evening. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Phil. I'll uh, share my screen. Uh, thank, thank everybody who's uh, joining tonight. I, I recognize quite a few names as you were logging in. Um, and uh, this talk will be something of a retrospective. That is, um, I'm going to start it 20 years ago in some salvage archaeology that led, led me and others to the point that we are today. I mean, in the very end, I want to lean into uh, the future of, of uh, collaborative archaeology, the way um, that we see it happening here at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey. I, I will be speaking, as Phil mentioned, uh, on what I consider to be like the, the profound his cultural historical phenomenon of Cahokia, which is more than just this place. Uh, my talk, you know, will be traveling from western Wisconsin down to southwestern Illinois and ultimately into northwestern Mississippi. Uh, we could go beyond that, uh, but tonight we're going to stay uh, in the U.S., um, except for the first few slides um, that I'm going to show you a couple of images from Mesoamerica, just for context. Uh, and, and that's a, it's an important context. In fact, um, I believe the Mesoamerican historical connections now to be um, very real and crucial to understanding what we're going to be talking about otherwise tonight. Uh, in fact, so much so that I've gone back to an earlier uh, scholarly definition of greater Mesoamerica that recognized a very fluid border between um, what is now more rigidly defined as Mesoamerica south of the US-Mexico border and, and the various um, states of the United States, here shown with this white line, which incorporates the Southwest um, and also the Mississippi Valley and the, um, and the, you know, the Mississippian phenomenon. Um, also on the slide are a few of the places that I'm gonna mention. Um, in part, I, well, first I want to highlight the Crenshaw site, which you'll see is in southwestern Arkansas. I'm going to come back to that in, in just a minute. Um, now, by, 
by way of a land acknowledgement, I also want to, to notice how the, the uh, greater Mesoamerican line is skewed way north, basically following the Mississippi River. Um, and let me say here at the beginning that, of course, this is the central geomorphological feature of the interior of, of mainland North America. Traditionally, the territories of many dispossessed native nations of Algonquian, Caddo, Cadolan, Chuerin, Deguian, and Tunican heritage, among many others. Uh, and this great valley continues to carry the stories um, of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. And my own presentation specifically is indebted to Caddo, Ho-Chunk, Omaha, Osage, Quapaw, Pawnee, and Peoria peoples of whom I, I thank a few specific elders, scholars, and activists at, at the end. <clears throat> uh, the moon was and is a rain bringer um, for most of the peoples that I just mentioned. In fact, for farmers everywhere today. And it's, it's based on a very obvious, uh, seemingly obvious phenomenon. And that is what you're looking at here, which is before a warm front uh, and when the conditions are right and the moon is full, uh, you will often see a ring around the moon. And that circle um, is a harbinger of, of rain uh, two days later or so. Um, and farmers all over uh, in the past and the present know this. And in fact, the Caddo of Southern Oklahoma and Arkansas and Northeastern Texas even said that the raindrops, uh, raindrops were the tears of the moon. Uh, and named their town leaders after the moon. Um, and in fact, an entire confederacy would be led by someone referred to as Lord Full Moon. And you can see that um, this is also built into early Cadoan or uh, Caddo sites. In fact, you're looking at one of the early foundational Caddo sites um, in the Red River of, of uh, southwestern Arkansas, the Crenshaw site that I mentioned a minute ago. And you can see that in this um, early complex, which was probably built around 900 in the shape that you see it here based on this old map, uh, features an alignment to the moon. Um, you can see that there's an earthen causeway that connects a circular platform mound, which uh, are all important, to a rectangular uh, space or mound in this case, um, and it's bifurcated uh, by an alignment to what I label here as the minimum south moon rise. Now, let me say something really quickly about the moon. Uh, most of us don't think so much about the fact that not only does the moon um, cycle through a month um, through its various phases, but there's actually a long cycle of the moon, given the way that the moon orbits around the Earth, which is not um, uh, the same as the ecliptic that the Earth orbits around the sun. So it takes a full 18.6 years for the moon to rise and set along the horizon um, uh, in the same position. Uh, that is, um, the moon will rise far to the north and then uh, in the same year it will rise far to the south and it takes another 18.6 years for that to happen again. In between which it, it also goes through a year in which it rises and sets um, close to the equinox, so that is close to um, east, west, uh, and that's the minimum position, which, which is marked here um, by, at this Caddo site. Um, and uh, this whole configuration you'll see is important um, at, at Cahokia. Now, <clears throat> uh, I wanna think on this. Um, so where does recognizing the fact that uh, sort of a simple fact that the, the moon has a cultural historical importance in uh, 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 native North America, where does that take us? Well, one thing it forces us to think big and I think you'll see why. Um, first, we have to understand that everything I'm about to talk about happens at, uh, when a lot of other things are happening in North America down through Mesoamerica. Um, and it's a period of climate change. It's uh, uh, in, in North America, it's largely a period of warming. Um, and in much of Mesoamerica, especially say in the Maya region, it's a period of drying um, and uh, collapse. Whereas uh, north of the border from Chaco um, through the Caddo region and into the Mississippi Valley, it, it's a region of 
uh, it's a period of uh, greater water, so warmer and wetter conditions, so ideal for, say, corn agriculture. In fact, <clears throat> by 900, you have the first real adoption of corn or maize in the Caddo heartland um, along the Red River and then up into the Mississippi Valley, Mississippi Valley at Cahokia, all presaging the what happens at around 1050, which is the uh, rapid emergence of an urban complex at Cahokia. Um, in lots of places from the Caddo, maybe even to Chaco, uh, certainly down into Mesoamerica, um, the, this period of climate change in the 800s and 900s you, is when, a time when you see the emergence of of a sort of a religious movement or a series of interdigitated religious movements, the centerpiece of which are circular uh, temples or shrines like the one you're looking at here, which is a, a Maya uh, shrine in Belize. Um, elsewhere, they look something like this. This is in Northeastern Mesoamerica and the Huasteca region. Uh, and this same form is actually ultimately pulled up into Cahokia and Cahokia's various um, related complexes um, by 1050. So something big is happening all across North America that helps explain um, what we're gonna be talking about. But <clears throat> let's, let's get more to the, to the point of the talk. Um, Cahokia, so at, at, in the midst of this um, continental change, climatic shifts, you do get the adoption of corn, as I said, in the in this part of the world that you're looking down on um, here, uh, in the Mississippi Valley, a particularly wide and fertile part of the floodplain of the Mississippi, um, at 900 or so, corn is adopted. Um, that sets in motion 150 years of gradual change where um, migration starts happening, people move into the area, and small villages become very large villages, um, probably fairly complex villages with. Um, uh, connections to the outside, uh, you know, the world beyond the region that you're looking at. Um, and then at 1050, you get um, what is really a, a, a sort of a, a novel, um, but true kind of urban development in taking place in that oddly shaped uh, red um, feature there in the middle, which are three precincts of, of a city um, and a series of related sites. In fact, to the to the east here, you can see two that I'm gonna spend some time on. One is called Emerald and the other is Pfeffer. And um, we're gonna to go to Pfeffer first uh, because this is where um, the story begins of the moon uh, accidentally because in 2000, um, uh, we were conducting some salvage excavations at the Pfeffer site, um, all which I kind of merge with research um, and field schools at the University of Illinois. And uh, we walked into the middle of what you're now looking down upon. So what you see is a circular mound, a circular platform mound called the Ford Mound. And then our excavation area to the south, which uh, was shortly after this, um, after 2007, bulldozed and built over. So these were very definitely salvage excavations um, uh, and you can see much of this site has already, had already been built over um, with houses and, uh, and various other things. Uh, what we found at the Pfeffer site in 2000 and 2007 were, was, struck me initially as odd. The series of fairly dispersed little houses, um, one slightly larger to, that you can see, again, this is, you're looking at the footprints of these rectangular buildings. Uh, uh, when excavated, they look something like this. You can see the rectangular outline, and that's Brenda Todd standing next to a storage pit that she's excavating in the floor of this um, building. Uh, or they look like this. Now, this, this particular building um, was, actually, I think I skipped us there. We skipped a slide. Um, uh, here's another footprint of two overlapping buildings. And this was our first hint that we had something that was uh, mysterious. Um, a, a, a building footprint that was then rebuilt over by a slightly later building at a slightly different angle. 
And what we noticed um, after excavating a series of these was that this pattern was repeated, the same angle for the first building and then the second building. Sometimes there would be a third building that would flip back to the first position, meaning that they were referencing something that was locatable on the horizon, presumably, um, and repeating it uh, back and forth. And the, <clears throat> this building uh, sort of cemented the pattern. Uh, this building, um, which was a special building with, maybe you can see there's a yellow clay floor on, on, uh, around the building. You can see the post molds around the edges. Um, and then in the interior, there's an odd diagonal, which was actually filled with more yellow clay and a layer of black clay on top of it. I scratched my head about this structure and about the other ones for years. Uh, this was dug in 2000. And, and only by around 2007 did I finally realize what we had and done some, did some reading, Ohio Hopewell and Chaco, um, and uh, realized that what they, these folks were doing at the Pfeffer site with some of their special buildings and otherwise some of their ordinary um, shelters was uh, aligning different constructions to different positions of that long cycle of the moon, mostly a minimum north moon rise and then a minimum, uh, a maximum north moon rise. And in this one special building, we had both. Okay. <clears throat> Already by 2007, there was a, another uh, ingredient in this pattern. Um, and it was at the Pfeffer site that we first really observed it. And it was that in the interim between the flipping of these buildings, you would all often get fill that was added. And the fill that was added not only was repeatedly lined with yellow and black clay, but also they would alternate their addition of fill. Um, they would alternate it with exposure to the elements, maybe even intentional pouring of water into some of these structures or pits, such that what you're looking at here is a series of laminated silts, which mean they're water laid, and then either debris laden fill or packed prepared fill. And that packed prepared fill is clean, processed mound fill, basically, um, as if they're not building a mound up, but they were building a mound down um, as they were engaged in a fairly ritually complex a series of actions involving the moon and water. Uh, it sometimes took the form of intentional excavations by the original occupants of the Pfeffer site back into their own water laid deposits. So what you can maybe see here, I'm gonna highlight for you. There's a, a kind of a halo effect. Um, this building had been allowed to silt up with water um, people then came back, dug a circular hole, put a post in that hole and sank it all the way into the floor, allowed the rain to wash in again and surround the post. And then finally, um, that inner circle is that prepared packed fill. They pulled the post out and put in very clean, carefully processed mound fill into the hole. Again, very uh, ritually complicated involving um, water and human action. So that got me thinking a lot about the moon, somewhat about water. I really didn't however, expect that it, that pattern would follow me to the next episode um, in my career, which was to go north. Um, in fact, initially I'd worked with Phil at the John Chapman site and I was intrigued with the, the Cahokia outliers, these sites that were hundreds of miles away from Cahokia, but that looked to be colonies or some kind of pilgrimage sites that involved um, Cahokians going there, building or doing something and then returning um, frequently. So we went to Trempolo um, in 2009, where I worked with Danielle Benden and Ernie Bozert for three years. Um, and it was fascinating because the uh, Mostly we focused on the Trempolo Bluffs, which you're looking at here. It's a unique landform. Um, part, of the, part of it sticks out into the Mississippi River. Uh, that part is covered with earlier burial mounds of a pre-Mississippi and pre-Cahokian period. But the little bluff piece to the south is 
and actually around the base of that is covered with a Cahokian occupation dating to around 1050. <clears throat> and we know that because in our excavations, um, right in the middle of Trempolo, uh, we found the little Cahokian houses um, and we found uh, Cahokia midden, that is the debris from them residing there at least seasonally and maybe in some cases year round. Um, and there we go. And, uh, and in that midden around those houses, classic Cahokia artifacts brought up by visiting Cahokians, um, including everything from their, their, their tool making debris to the pots that they must have uh, packed into canoes, uh, mostly to the gaming stones and, uh, and traveled up up the Mississippi and Illinois rivers, cut across land, down the rock, up the Mississippi to get to Trempolo, Wisconsin. And probably this was, as I said, somewhat seasonal. <clears throat> now, why would they be doing that? Uh, the site itself centers around a Cahokian shrine and in green highlight there outlined with the white dash, you can make out a rectangular flat top mound sitting on top of a bluff, that's the little bluff. Uh, there's more to it. In fact, that whole bluff uh, top was modified, sculpted, um, cut and filled by Cahokians. And when we, over the course of a couple of years, we realized that not only was it just a, a bluff top with a mound on it, but they had created um, a landform that they had then uh, reoriented. They turned the angle by cutting and filling, they turned the angle of that bluff a couple of three degrees such that it too aligns with a, uh, a minimum north moonrise position uh, precisely. Um, and I say precisely because the complex consists of that central platform and then two small little amounts at the ends of two equal uh, causeways of equal length um, that all create this very uh, um, easily aligned landscape and, and points you to the direction of this minimum north moonrise um, at this latitude around 1000 um, CE or AD um, with the horizon angle that they were looking at here. <clears throat> And also that also that pattern, by the way, of a big central figure, a big central monument with two little mounds is kind of reminiscent of a, of a lunar phenomenon that maybe some of you have seen. It's uh, the moon dogs on cold nights when there's a lot of ice crystals in the air. And this is common in Wisconsin. Um, uh, you can see that the moon, full moon will be, will have two rainbow like um, dogs to the to the sides and that may be in fact the very thing that they are mimicking on the ground at, at Trempolo. Again, uh, um, uh, the moon. Uh, not surprisingly, these are Cahokians. They have their yellow um, and black um, fill um, all over this um, uh, little bluff uh, monument. Uh, you can kind of see here, oops. Okay, uh, after, after uh, 2011, um, I'm very definitely was fascinated with the, the moon and these, um, the, the Cahokian obsession with, with the yellow clays, um, water, watery deposits and everything associated with that. And Susan Alt of Indiana University and, and I um, uh, settled on going to yet another uh, shrine complex near nearer Cahokia again to see what was what that was all about and this uh, this happens to be one that was all, that's also at the at this very moment is being damaged um, um, by excessive uh, modification by um, agricultural practices today. Um, uh, but by two, by 2012, you know, we had realized that this was not only lunar aligned, but maybe it was the best lunar aligned complex of everything that that um, uh, we had seen up to this point. And in fact, because you can see that what you're looking at are a series of little circular platform mounds. You're looking at bird's eye view down at Herb Rose, um, nice painting here. Um, little lines of mounds um, that in, in, that are. Uh, what perpendicular to 
a big platform mound, um, all in, in alignment to this maximum northern moonrise um, at this uh, at this latitude and horizon angle, et cetera. This is constructed at the same time that Cahokia is undergoing its urban transition around 1050. Uh, and I, we know that because over four years, um, we did a series of block excavations across this site, some in areas that were um, being damaged by the farmer who was building large agricultural terraces, more than you can even make out here. Um, some being damaged by erosion. This is, an, uh, uh, this is a 10, 15 meter high hill that is uh, made up of easily erodible luss. You can even see the erosion um, on this LIDAR image. Um, uh, and some because, including EB1 in the upper right, because it was on what seemed to be the main axis of the site. Um, one other thing that we realized after we started this was, and in part based on interviews with the farmers, uh, this hill is um, what uh, many people might, uh, indigenous folks might uh, have called a water hill. That is, it has a perched water table inside of it, and it literally seeps um, water year round out of its sides. And that's why farmers are busily um, creating terraces all around it. Uh, making it this interesting convergence again of the moon and the moon's tears. Here are, here are excavations, a couple of the blocks. Um, what you see, you're looking down or that we're under excavation are three or four of what we later called, what Susan actually dubbed shrine houses. And shrine houses were what I showed you earlier at the Pfeffer site. They're yellow um, clay lined, um, non-domestic, um, uh, old fashioned looking buildings that are set below, below the ground surface. Um, at the Emerald site, we discovered not only that these were aligned to the, the maximum um, uh, moonrise position, but also that they, they were stacked. That is, these buildings were, were literally stacked up uh, with construction fill um, uh, always laid down before um, the next series of shrine houses or pilgrim housing, as it were here, uh, were constructed. So there's a whole thick um, series of these things, uh, an sort of an amazing site, um, or probably the most complicated thing that I've ever worked on. Those shrine houses would have looked uh, something like the building on the left, um, a bent pole, uh, arbor roofed um, construction. You can also see some of the other buildings um, common to the Emerald site. Uh, there's a small steam bath or a sweat lodge right in front of us. And then behind it is a very large uh, temple or a council house. Uh, you can see with a, a very prominent post probably projecting through the roof based on our reconstructions of one of these. In fact, <clears throat> that, that the digital image you just saw is a reconstruction of this, of this part of the site. Um, and this part of the site is the part of the site was, that, that was on that main uh, lunar axis that I showed you earlier. In fact, that main lunar axis runs to about there within a meter or so. Uh, the central post of one of these big council houses. Um, turns out that this whole part of the site was closed down with water. Um, that is when people at some time in the early 1100s deconstructed all these buildings and then allowed a, a, a major rain, probably a thunderstorm to wash over the whole site um, and at the last instant, uh, presumably during or before a rain, offerings were placed. Um, the most, the most uh, prominent one was a human sacrifice in that post pit buried in water. Um, you cannot see that here. And in fact, she was left, uh, probably this is a, a young girl, um, could have been a young boy, which is not an uncommon thing at Cahokia. Um, uh, so all you're seeing here is the water washed silts that were over the top of this um, child burial. Um, uh, 
uh, which again, we, we left in place once we realized um, uh, what, what, was, what was here. And this is safely down below the, the current day uh, farmer's plow. So this is Susan and Sarah Byrus um, looking at each other, realizing and discussing next steps. Uh, certainly uh, everything about the, the Emerald site says it, it, the moon and water are intimately co-associated um, at, a, at a complex that looks actually to have been located off to the side, out near the edge of the prairie, um, the Illinois prairie. Um, uh, and while it has thick layers of buildings, very few of them, if any, look to have been lived in for an entire year. It looks to have been a place where people came and went. Um, and our best guess is they were coming and going on that lunar cycle once every 9.3 years or every 18.6 years. Building buildings, whenever they're there to align with the moon, the moon um, event, the, the lunar event that's coming up that particular year. <clears throat> now, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised with the excessive attention um, that water is giving, uh, given around Cahokia. We've known for centuries, well, a century, that the, you know, the main um, uh, uh, valuable of Cahokia um, are marine shells um, that are acquired from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and you're looking at the main one here, this is a lightning whelk. Uh, and you're also looking at um, a cup in the lower left, which was modeled on the shape of a lightning whelk, um, which you can also cut into making cups. Uh, with the kind of the swirly volute um, of a lightning whelk um, on, the, on its side. Um, these were used, uh, we realized a few years ago, to drink an all important ritual drink, a caffeinated tea um, that almost certainly originates to the south, not, it's not grown around Cahokia. Um, Yopan Holly, um, sometimes known by its Latin name, Ilex vomitoria. Um, or the black drink, um, a caffeinated tea. If you boil it down, it's really strong uh, and, and it is a, gives you a better jolt than a good strong cup of coffee. Uh, we also probably shouldn't be surprised with the Cahokian, um, the importance of water, if not the moon at Cahokia, in part because something that um, Susan Alt uh, realized after working at the Emerald site, which you can see to the, to the right um, on this map, um, which is connected to Cahokia, by the way, by a road, um, uh, um, an indigenous road. Um, because if you stand back and you look at the region, what she realized was actually there's a whole series of extraordinary water features um, across this landscape, and especially karst. That is sinkhole caves, um, access points into the watery underworld. Um, as you see on the, on the left, that's a Stemler cave that shows up on this map. Um, to the north, south, and west of Cahokia. In fact, one of Cahokia's main precincts, St. Louis, is built over this very kind of landscape. Um, and this is why St. Louis also becomes the Anheuser-Busch Bush capital because beer, is, beer was stored you know, underground in these caverns initially in St. Louis. Um, and so uh, Cahokians knew this, or not about beer, but Cahokians you know, built over these caverns um, and in the same way that later uh, German American folks you know, used it, um, also used the caverns. So it's a special landscape. You look up and down the river, in fact, this may be one of the most special places. You have water hills to the east, You've got karst to the west. You have a, a broad floodplain full of oxbow lakes and other unique features in the middle. So <clears throat> this all is suggesting that kind of a normal view of Cahokia, uh, which is as you know, as a city um, covered in green manicured grass uh, in the middle of a floodplain, is is only partially right. Uh, because what is usually left out is, is the fact that it was probably built to straddle uh, uh, dry land 
and water. Um, in fact, if you were there at the right time of the year, what you really see is that there's a whole series of water features at Cahokia itself. Uh, here you have a, a circular platform mound um, overlooking a reservoir. Uh, sometimes they're called borrow pits at Cahokia. They fill up with water and they probably had water in them um, at least a good part of the year, um, a thousand years ago. Uh, so there are, there are features like this. And there are a whole series of what we now realize, thanks to LIDAR, um, are, are causeways. What you're looking at here is entirely constructed, uh, artificial landscape built, built uh, in the 1000s or early 1100s. Um, this is a short causeway from where the photographer is standing to a small rectangular platform that's sticking out in the middle of one of these borrow pit reservoirs. Uh, there are actually a number of other such causeways, some very long, some very short. If you look in between some of the, some of the uh, rectangular and circular platforms like here, there's a short little causeway. Uh, same thing up in the north, same thing between this rectangular platform and this circular platform here was a causeway. And then the long causeways that run from the, the, the main urban complex of this particular precinct down into a low wet uh, watery world uh, to the south. Uh, there, it may be, as I try to show in this slide, that up to a quarter to a third of all the mounds of Cahokia are actually these circular platform mounds. Um, sometimes, like at Emerald, they seem to be in rows. Uh, sometimes, you know, they have causeways linking them to other things. Sometimes they're in rows. Um, what's on those circular platforms, seemingly, uh, where we have any evidence at all, are circular steam baths or, or big formal sweat lodges. Uh, you can see one here on the left that was, um, this mound had been, being borrowed, borrowed in the 50s. And so some excavations caught the second half of a circular building on what ends up being a huge uh, circular flat top pyramid. And then the, the one on the right, obviously, is a long time ago, um, a similar kind of situation. These are, these are buildings, <clears throat> not unlike circular um, water shrines among the Maya or in the Huasteca, where a person would go for an experience, both a, a religious experience, um, uh, where you would sit around um, hot rocks and, and a priest might come in um, and pour water over the hot rocks to, to produce steam, which you would then breathe in, or you know, would condense on your skin and have all kinds of, of healthy benefits. Um, you know, it, it soothes aches and pains, um, it, it helps deal with common colds, it's refreshing, and that's that's what um, um, you know. They're still used for today. Uh, in a way, which what we're, what we kind of have realized because of all of these projects leading up to to now reexamining Cahokia is that people might go to Cahokia for the health benefits. Um, it's a place of healing. Uh, you want to go there. <clears throat> it's giving you something back in the form of these buildings, which, by the way, weren't in this region at all until 1050. With the, with the construction of this urban complex itself. And now we even know that the, the center point of the entire city of Cahokia, which is where this uh, yellow line is followed a big long causeway up to, um, to the top of the of Monk's Mound, the, the big flat top pyramid. Uh, this point on this mound used to have um, a, a little circular mound on top of the, of the front end uh, of the main pyramid. Um, it was recognized by George Rogers, Clark, and others way back um, as being like the highest point in the site. Uh, doing some recent geophysics there um, where no one had ever done this before, we actually found um, footprints of circular steam baths um, right where this, the mound had been. In fact, there's probably a whole series of these circular mounds and with their surmounting circular steam baths down into the main pyramid um, um, on each level that um, Cahokians would have built over the years. So let me see if I can highlight that. It's hard to see, but um, there's a couple 
patterns that you can see there, right? And that's right on this center point, the high, highest point of the main pyramid here, I'll show you again. And with a big, a seemingly a big hearth in the middle. <clears throat> that is in Herb Rowe's um, excellent um, painting, that, that mound in the very, the mound on the mound in the very center of this image, which has a post showing on it here, actually would have had a circular building more like this one um, on top of it here. Uh, um, so the, the axis mundi, you know, the point where the vertical and the horizontal axes merge at the center of everything was a circular steam bath, something that did not exist in this region again before 1050. Um, in fact, it didn't exist, these didn't exist in, across much of the, of the Midwest or South until after Cahokians pulled them in. And it's a good bet they pulled them in, maybe from the Caddo region, ultimately from Mesoamerica, where they had already existed um, since 800s, 900s. Uh, here you're looking at, an, at an, another version of this at, at the Shiloh site in Tennessee. The, in the foreground is a small circular platform, which had a circular steam bath on top of it. In the background, you see a um, rectangular flat top um, platform. This is a site which had a Cahokian presence uh, and, and, and some spectacular Cahokian artifacts, at least one really spectacular one, showing this linkage um, in southern, uh, southern Tennessee. Uh, <clears throat> we know, in fact, we've also known for years that Cahokia had clearly had Southern connections um, and were doing something similar in the South that they seem to have been doing in the North at places like Trempolo, in part based on things like this. These are uh, arrow points from the Caddo region into the lower Mississippi Valley, uh, Mississippi and Louisiana um, from, from uh, one of the Cahokia precincts. Um, so, it seems that Cahokia was actually qu quite interested in the South. Um, and it, in the South, we might even have a pretty good understanding of why Cahokians were so interested in the South um, um, by shifting our research down to a place like Carson. Um, and that reason seems to be that there are some very potent, very important um, uh, ritual materials that Cahokians are needed. Uh, foremost among those is the Yopan holly plant uh, from which you can dry the leaves and make this caffeinated beverage that was described widely um, at contact and used up, uh, no, up till today really um, uh, across the South. Um, uh, yet we find it uh, its greatest use maybe at Cahokia far to the North of its natural range. Cahokians, we presume then we're importing um, dried yopen holly uh, to make this beverage. And we presume this because we have all the parts. We have the, the yopen holly drinking cups in the lower left. Um, we have the vats. Um, ignore the corn in the inside of that pot to the right. It's almost certainly was used to boil up um, uh, the black drink made from Yopan Holly. Um, and then the symbolism of, you know, the water uh, and or liquid symbolism, um, uh, maybe the winds um, around the outside of that. And then there's even a Cahokian carving. This one's from a private collection found on, on a surface just to the south of Cahokia, showing a Cahokian holding a, a, a black drink cup in his right hand, sitting in front of a vat, a pot, um, presumably, I would guess, um, a boiling um, black drink. So we, we may have a reason that Cahokians are really interested in going south. There's, there's the, the marine shell at the Gulf. There's Yopen Holly in Mississippi and Point South. And we also have a, uh, a site much like Trempolo uh, in Wisconsin in the state of Mississippi that has um, Cahokian occupations. And by that, I mean, there's, we already know that in one of these starred locations, there are, are little Cahokian houses and a little Cahokian colony of, of a sort. 
Um, and there may be others in these other star locations. This is a huge complex. Um, and it's here that we are hoping to build uh, somewhat with the help of Caitlin Antonuk, who's here shown uh, holding a magnetometer. This is gonna be your dissertation research. Um, we wanna build a larger collaborative project um, where we're bringing together the local community around Clarksdale, Mississippi. We're bringing in um, uh, indigenous um, uh, advisors and students um, and, and archeologists who are interested in this bigger problem um, of what in the world Cahokia is doing um, down into the South. Uh, so here, just let me give a shout out to the other folks in the, in the slides. Um, uh, archaeologists, there's Caitlin Antonuk, Aaron Benson, Aline Betzenhauser, and Liz Watts Malujos. And then to the right, there's Kerry Wilson. We were out here just last, well, uh, just, just last week, Kerry Wilson of the Quapaw, um, um, beginning this, at least thinking about beginning this project um, in Mississippi. So it may not surprise you either uh, if it's aligned to the moon. Now, so I asked in the beginning of this talk, where does appreciating the cultural historical importance of the moon, or actually more accurately, the tears of the moon, uh, where does that take us? You can, you've seen here that it's, it's taken me um, from, from Cahokia to Wisconsin and now down to Mississippi and points in between. Uh, but where it, it takes us, I think, and based on this sort of two decade uh, two decades worth of salvage work and, and research, it takes us in two directions. Um, first, in sort of the immediate future, um, it's gonna see us here at the Illinois State Archaeological Survey developing a collaborative community-based archeology span of, of in, uh, indigenous participants, local community partners at the site of Carson and environs um, in order to understand the role of the South in producing Cahokia. Um, in fact, maybe even you know, beyond this to the far, far south, uh, down through the Gulf into that mysterious world of Mesoamerica to the south. <clears throat> and again, this might also be a period of climate change so that we have to understand that this is all happening um, and we may get a better understanding of the relationship of climate change in the medieval era, era um, with respect to this Cahokia phenomenon. So that's one direction. Second direction is more long, long term, um, where I think the moon and it's the tears of the moon um, should lead us all, I think, to, to answers regarding the always difficult question of human motivation. Like, why do people do, do what they do? Why do they build civilizations? And here, the, the moon, its connections to water, ancestors, maize, the black drink, um, it seems to me motivated people to travel widely, um, to try to know the world beyond and to bring some of it back and build it into their own um, homes. Um, and ultimately this is, this is what motivated people um, to build the civilization that, that um, we have in the Mississippi Valley. Thank you. Lots of people to thank, lots of institutions. And thank you all. Thank you very much. We have several questions there. We have a whole list of questions I've been collecting. So um, I'm just gonna say to everyone watching that we probably won't make it to all of them, of course, but I'm gonna do my best to kind of pick some at random um, and uh, we'll do our best. So. Should I Do stop sharing to... my screen? Yes, I was going to ask you if you minded doing that for me. There we go. Hey, there we are. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Okay, so um, one of the first questions is, it says, uh, one of our uh, attendees says, you've drawn our attention to a small number of Mississippian sites of the many other sites that have been studied is there similar evidence of moon-based religious practices or are the few you focus on special cases amongst the others? 
Excellent question. And that was actually one of my questions. Um, and it's the question of other, other folks, uh, archaeoastronomer Bill Romain, for instance. There is a bigger history within which the one that I presented is situated. Um, and and it, it's older. So there are, um, this lunar, the long cycle of the moon was recognized even before Cahokia in the Middle Woodland era. Um, in Ohio, it's, it's, uh, it's represented fairly well. Um, um, at some of the classic sites, you know, of Ohio Hopewell. Um, there are a couple of, at least a couple of later sites that we can recognize, one in Arkansas, the one I showed you, Crenshaw, in, in Southern Arkansas also. Um, at the same time that you have, um, uh, people were, were building in the long cycle of the moon into the Pueblos out in Chaco. So um, yeah, there's more. Now this, this little episode at Cahokia, um, is not necessarily surrounded. Not everybody is 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 uh, is building in the long cycle of the moon into their sites. Um, some some people are. There are whole Mississippian regions where they are not. And 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 then there's the later Mississippian era, past 1200, certainly past 1300, where they are not at all. It's it's a it's a earlier cultural phenomena that is discontinued um, most, most likely later in the uh, pre-contact era. Okay, um, the next question, someone asks if the orientations of the building were being done visually um, or were they being calculated somehow? Another really good question and one that uh, we asked at the Emerald site specifically because we had uh, so much evidence there. And it, it, it seemed to be the case that the big important buildings and certainly the mounds are very precisely laid out probably by a specialist, a priest, a leader who knew the, the horizon points to align things to. If, if, if they didn't actually have a recorded um, map you know, or some trigonometric kinds of imagery on, on a drawing that they were using. Then if you go down to the ordinary shrine houses or the little you know, uh, visitor housing or, or whatever, those are more generally aligned. So you get more error, two or three degrees, as if they're kind of, they know kind of the general direction and they, but they're building their own house without the help of a priest standing there telling them which way to do it. So, so the answer is both. Okay, let's see here. Okay, um, one of the questions is, what's your assessment of the extent of central rulership at Cahokia? How much of what went on there and in its distant connections resulted from a king-like or pope-like leaders and their bureaucracies versus more grassroots religious movements and revitalizations? Uh, uh. Um, that's a tough question, actually, because so much of what archaeologists thought in the past in answers to questions like this have been based on supposition, um, models that have proven to be wrong. Um, and probably it's also the answer is not going to remain uniform through time. At some point, you could you could well imagine um, a council of, of elders, let's say, that came together and had a plan that they agreed on to accomplish some end. Um, at the same time, you could imagine um, that at certain periods, maybe one of those people might emerge as dominant and even make very political, overt political moves to be in charge. Uh, it, it does seem over the course of the early Mississippian to later Mississippian, um, not just at Cahokia, but at Cahokia, you do go from uh, evidence that things are more collaborative or more group-based organizations to more uh, restricted uh, organizations of control, where there's you know one building, you know, and and things are concentrated here or there, and that is certainly the case when you leave Cahokia and you go to other Mississippian regions around the South, um, clearer elites when you get to outside of Cahokia. Okay, someone asks if you, if there has been any residue analysis done on the black drinking cups. 
yes. the black drink cups. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, I was at a talk in Santa Fe of Patty Crown, uh, and she had just been looking for chocolate in Chaco vases. And I went up to her afterwards and I said, you know, we have these beakers that could be like these vases. And I wonder if there's chocolate in them. So we teamed up with a series with Tom Emerson and a series of other scientists, and we looked for chocolate. And instead we found evidence of the black drink. Um, and so, uh, and uh, some others have looked for similar things. Uh, there's some, there's some controversy over the results, but it's pretty clear that yes, we have definitive evidence of the black drink in these Cahokia beakers. Um, and there's more, there's still more yet to be done where we don't know again about how it changes through time or wherever Cahokians are, 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 you know, are they doing it there? Are they doing it over here? Um, who else is getting the, the ritual knowledge of the black drink? We're, we're not sure. So. Okay, there's been several questions from multiple people about how um, Cahokia might be related to Hopewell sites. Do you mind talking a little bit about that? Uh, they're not directly related. That is, there's a great gulf of time, centuries, in between the end of the Hopewell era, 400 AD or so, and the beginning of corn agriculture at 900 and urban Cahokia at 1050. Now. However, that said, um, there's no doubt that later people, Cahokians um, in this case, looked at ancient sites all around them of Hopewell people and might have studied them and might have realized certain things by studying them or walking through them. So in a way they are, they potentially are learning from, and there might even be old stories that are passed down, you know, from, from, uh, um, priest to priest or what have you through time that could have survived, but it's, that's still a fairly indirect uh, link. Um, interestingly, there is one, uh, this is actually the work of Liz Watts Malujos, but there is one complex in Southern Indiana that was a, a big middle woodland complex that Mississippians later reoccupy. Um, and the Mississippians who reoccupy it build the angel site and they may be kind of borrowing the lunar alignments that they see at this middle woodland site and you know, re, rebuilding them into the, into the earth nearby. Um, it's a little unclear, um, but there are otherwise, you know, there's not a direct lineal relationship. Okay, um, let's see here. I'm trying to pick some at random because we have newer ones and older ones, and I know we're not going to make it to everybody. So I'm trying to be fair here. Um, someone asks, what are your biggest surprises or unexpected revelations you've encountered in your Cahokia research? Boy, that's a tough one. Um, I got to tell you, the, the moon, the, 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 which I did with the thing I just presented to you when I started out, I never thought I would go there. I, I wasn't really interested in archaeoastronomy and I got, I was pulled into it. And so almost unbeknownst to me for a while, I was headed in this direction. So that, this probably does rank as the biggest surprise. Um, I know it's not sort of immediate discovery. There are a series of little discoveries that I could list but this big picture uh, that I'm presenting here to you today is not where I started out. <laughs> so some of our um, attendees are making connections between Cahokia and Chaco. And so they're trying to, uh, there's been questions about trading um, and the black drink and the cacao findings at Chaco and that kind of thing. Um, is there any relation there? Was there any evidence that they were trading? And I guess maybe to tack on to that, because there's also questions from people about the connection to Mesoamerica. So as far as like trading all around, I guess they want to, there's a lot of questions about trading. Um, good questions. Uh, certainly the Southwest and, the, and Mesoamerica were more intimately linked um, and you have some of the language speakers in the Southwest are also in Mesoamerica, Udo Aztecan folks, for instance. Um, 
so you could you could point to things like chocolate there or macaws or copper bells and you could say there's some kind of trade that's not really the case um, between the, either the southwest and the east and mississippi valley or mesoamerica and the mississippi valley instead what's more likely and those long distance connections are one-off events where there's travel somebody who is a would-be leader let's say or somebody who's looking is on a quest will travel a long distance to gain knowledge and then we'll spend some time wherever the destination is and then come back and we'll reveal this new knowledge to the local community and th that's the kind of connection we're looking at mostly between those regions um, and uh, the Mississippi Valley. Within the Mississippi Valley, sure, they're, they're out there trading and acquiring all these um, exotic materials and powerful substances. It's not just the open holly. Um, there's possible morning glories, that's morning glory seeds, which is a hallucinogenic coming from the South. Um, there may be a healthy uh trade in datura which is another hallucinogenic in the south um, and some other odds and ends exotic materials that cahokians want let's see here we have a question Hold on, let me find it here Someone says, related to the color of the dirt clay floors, does it possibly relate to the four sacred colors and directions? Uh, yes, it possibly does. Um, I mean, different descendant groups have different variations on which color is associated with which direction. I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised if, if those colors are referenced to, di to directions. Those things can change through time to or context. Um, uh, and, and also we may not be seeing the full, uh, you know, uh, what array of colors, um, we're seeing these prominent yellows and blacks, um, around Cahokia. There may be some other missing things that were being painted, uh, that we're not really, we're not really seeing. So I, I'm not able to give a great answer to that one. I thought the question was going to be, does yellow relate to the moon or to corn? which I also would scratch my head over and say, yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take one more question and then I have like a very final question for you and we'll be wrapping it up here. Um, there was a question about were there matriarchal power tones or instances of sacred spaces specific to the sacred feminine that were very much celebrated and recognized to indigenous cultures throughout North America, associated with lunar sites specifically, is what they're asking. Uh, well, let me stick more to the to the Midwest and Mid South rather than trying to generalize across the continent. Um, yes, in fact, I didn't emphasize that in this talk. Um, women figure much more prominently um, both in the present day in descendant communities with the moon in terms of naming or other cultural associations than do men. Um, and if you look at the pre-contact array of Mississippian complexes, Cahokia stands out as having much more feminine associations and symbolism than almost any other Mississippian complex you know, in the eastern, southeastern United States. And it also happens to be the earliest and the biggest. So clearly Cahokia, and, and even in the art, I didn't show, um, I didn't show really any art except for one figurine. And then that one was a male one, but mostly they're female and mostly they're feminine gods. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a very big deal. It's almost certainly, um, you know, matrilineal, matro, matrifocal generally. Um, Okay, and for your final question, um, someone asked if you had published any recent research, and if so, how could they find it so they could read more? Uh, coming to a book near you, near you soon will be an even bigger narrative. And this is um, um, hopefully a, a more popularly written book, well, I think it is, um, that, that delves into these Mississippian connections with the Southwest and with uh, Mesoamerica. 
Um, and I think it's currently titled Gods of Thunder because it really is all about this God that emerges in Mesoamerica that I think is also transferred into Mississippi Valley, the thunderer or uh, the wind that brings rain. And that's the God that's associated with those circular platforms. So that'll be, that'll be out, I guess, mid to late next year. Well, you'll have to let us know. We can let our, we can definitely share it and let people know. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Do you have any parting Words or anything else you'd like to say? Um, uh, no, uh, let me let me thank the Archaeological Conservancy, um, uh, April, you and Phil, um, and um, say how much I enjoyed it and hope everybody got something out of it. And that's I think it. everyone enjoyed it very much. <laughs> so, Phil, do you have anything else you would like to add before we close tonight? No, oh, I just want maybe just a quick add. <clears throat> A final thank you for to you to put this together and also for Tim, as busy as he is, accepting this and giving giving a talk like this to to a broad audience. I, I knew they'd really appreciate his perspective on things. Excellent. Well, I just want to thank all of our attendees. We had a great audience tonight and lots of fantastic questions. I'm very, very sorry we didn't make it to everybody, but that would be impossible. Um, the recording will be avail available on YouTube tomorrow and we will also be doing some other special events coming up so please check our website and thank you guys so much have a great evening <laughs>